ضيفتي بالاستوديو اليوم هي الاخت سوغير كسخاي من ايران سوغير كان عمرها ست سنين لما شافت المسيح اول مره على الصليب بايطاليا بعمر سبع سنين شافت الصليب مره ثانيه ولكن من دون شخص المسيح وسالت هي عمرها سبع سنين وين راح هيدا الشخص يلي كان معلق على الصليب قصة صغير رح نعرفها اليوم سواء هي ضيفتي بالاستوديو صغير I would like to welcome you today to our show without shackles and thank you for giving us this time thank you for inviting me صغير you are Iranian uh, who fled to Italy when you were six years old with your parents Tell me a little bit about that. Why you fled from, uh, from Iran to Italy and what happened to you there? Uh, well, my, f my father's family uh, is Baha'i yes. and my mother's family is, is Muslim. And um, during the revolution, the Baha'is were persecuted in Iran and my father's family fled and went to the United States. And we were to follow him afterwards. He, he went to the United States to start a life for our family. And we were going to go to, to Italy for a, a day to pick up a visa in Rome. Um, unfortunately, uh, it was right around the time of the hostage crisis. And so they were not granting visas to Iranians. So we were, we were forced to stay in Italy as refugees um, until we, we were able to leave after. So there, there were only place for us to go um, at that time was this convent in northern, Genoa, uh, northern Italy in Genoa. So my mother and my sister and I were there for about a year and a half. Mm. Yeah. And your, your father was in, this, in the United States back then? Yes. And you were trying to join him? Yes. But for you, because you didn't have all your papers, you had to stay in, in Italy for yes. a year and a half. Yes. And as you told me uh, before, it's there when you saw the cross for the first time. Yes. And you asked, who's that man? <laughs> well, my sister and I, we played in the sanctuary of this beautiful old church. And um, my, I have very few memories of my, of my, my time in Italy, but the most, most of obviously the most important memory for me is, is seeing this man on the cross. Mm. And um, my question for my mom was, why are there nails in his hands and feet? Mm. And he had a, a crown of thorns on his head and he had this you know, look on his face that as a child, I think y you, you feel sad, you feel empathy, but I didn't know why. So even at age of six, you did not just like thought, okay, whatever, it's a statue or something. No, it, no. It stopped you and made you think. Well, the, the man became my friend. I talked to him. He was, he, he became, you know, the, the, the actually, we, we, my mother would joke with me because I would say, who is this guy? And mm -hmm. she would say, nothing. It's just holy. It's nothing, mm. you know. She never really answered the questions. And the nuns there, they were great. They never pushed, you know, us to become, you know, Catholic or, you know, to tell us what the story was. But for me... I wanted to know why, but I never got the answer as to so why. So you never asked the nuns there, like, no. who is he or... Okay. No, we were children. I mean, I think you don't really ask the questions as, as a child. But um, it wasn't until we finally, you know, joined my father. In the United States. In the United States. Um, that I wanted to know really why. Um, mm -hmm. So, so you were you were from a Baha'i family, like your father was Baha'i. My father was Baha'i and my mother was Sunni. Was, no, oh, Shia. 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 So, what kind of religion did you practice at home? Well, you know, in in the the start of the revolution, um, I remember going from no hijab to wearing hijab. You know, it's yourself at the age of six, or yeah. the people? No, no, at six. You know, when it was the at the beginning of the revolution, I was just about to enter first grade. Mm. So I remember the time before hijab and the time after, you know, mandatory hijab. For me as a child, it was like, oh, it was exciting to wear something over your head, but you don't really know what's happening as a as a kid. Okay. You just know that the grown ups up there are not the same. Mm. For me, it was this anger. There was this, everybody was on, on sort of on edge, 
nobody was happy anymore. I didn't see smiling. It was something had switched over for me as a child. Right. So, um, what was the practice at home? I remember my grandfather praying. That's my memory. Mm -hmm. And always trying to distract him because he was like he was a robot, prostrating, you know, mm -hmm. putting his head to the ground, coming up, putting, you know, for me it was like, I, I, didn't, I didn't understand the language because it was in Arabic. Oh, okay. You know? He would pray in Arabic. He would, sp he would pray in Arabic. And for us, we speak Farsi. So it was like, how do you speak to God in a language you don't even understand yourself? Mm -hmm. It just didn't make sense. It was very mechanical. It was very dry. Mm -hmm. And what we were taught in school was there's, this, there's the only way and you either, go to, you, know, you either go this way, if you go to the right or you go to the left, you're going to die and you're going to go to hell. Mm. And it was very scary for a kid to think, I'm did, never going to be able to do anything wrong, you know. Did that idea, like, bother you, torture you? How it did you think me. about it I felt a like child. I was in, in a constant rat race mm. to try to do as many good things to make up for the naughty things that you do as a child. Mm. You know, it's not that way. As innocent as they are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So when you went to Italy, did you, uh, were you still wearing the hijab? No, no, no. Okay. No, my, my, father, my, fa my father's family and my mother's family completely opposed the Islamic revolution. You know, they um, were not, you know, fanatical. Mm -hmm. They did not believe that we um, should, that's why my family fled, you know, because his, his, my father's family was persecuted and... Um, you know, we, we, were, we were not momen, like we practiced, but we weren't, we didn't believe that it should, in, you know, uh, be a part, of, a part of the government. Right. So we believed in the separation, that okay. everybody should choose between, yeah. you know. So you left Italy, went to the United States. Yes. And... Uh, Unfortunately, when we came to the United States, my, fam my, my mother and my father separated. Um, my father... Maybe, maybe we can talk about this if you, if you wish now, or we can talk about it after you tell me a little bit about what happened to that guy on the cross. <laughs> well, my father abandoned my mom, mm -hmm. and my mom uh, had to start her life over. And... Uh, she worked six days a week, seven days a week sometimes. And on Sundays, uh, there was a woman who took care of my, mother, my sister and I, um, Miss Betty, whom I dearly loved. She was this lovely woman who passed a couple years ago. But, you know, she helped my mom and took, us, took, take, took care of us. And on Sunday, she took us to church with her. Mm -hmm. And there was that cross again. And, um, and you were seven. I was seven at this time. And I still didn't speak, I mean, I didn't speak English at all, but I knew, I knew that there was this place that she would take us was full of love and the singing, even the praying, you know, the people, the way that people pray to me was so, so peaceful. It was so unlike Islam for me. It was the complete opposite. There mm -hmm. was so much warmth. There was so much in the transcended the language barrier. And I, I remember thinking, okay, where's the, where's the guy? The guy in the cross, he wasn't there anymore. Oh, you saw the cross, but the cross did not have, have the, Jesus I on know. it. Okay. And so it was through the picture stories that we were, that we were taught about what happened to that man. And I fell in love with him, you know, and I fell in love with the idea that God loves you no matter how many bad things that you do mm. and that he forgives you. And... Um, I, I decided to surrender my spirit to him because I wanted him to be my father. At what age was that? Um, it was around 11, 12 that I really started to understand, um, you know, the story of redemption that, you know, God the Father loves you and that he sent his son mm -hmm. to show you the greatest love story ever told. Mm -hmm. So at, at age seven, you were introduced to Christianity, you were introduced to the empty cross. Jesus is not on the cross, yes. cross. So you knew that he died and rose, and this is the redemption yes. story. Yes. So how much did you learn about it before you surrender your life to Christ? 
Like, what did you understand and how, how did it hit you and how did it touch your heart? Well, there was my first Bible that Miss Betty gave me. There was a picture of a man holding a little girl on his, on his, um, on his shoulders, like mm -hmm. in his arms. And that picture spoke to me more than any words could have. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when we came to the United States, I felt like our family broke. Because of the separation. Because of the separation and a feeling of abandonment and my mother having to start her life over. She was always, you know, angry mm -hmm. and, you know, she was working and I could see that she was bitter. But um, there, was, there was that place that I could go to where I felt, you know, where I felt um, whole. Mm -hmm. And God scooped me up and scooped my family up and put, us, or put our broken family back together again. And um, I loved Miss Betty. She loved us with unconditional love. Mm -hmm. She helped my mother. She, you know, gave us rides. She took us to the grocery store. You know, whatever we needed, she met us. She met our needs. She met our family's, um, you know, uh, um, moments of, of feeling abandoned and mm -hmm. alone. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I decided to give my life to Christ. And my mother got really angry with Miss Betty. Really? Yeah. She said, oh, you're just children. You don't know what you're doing. You don't have enough maturity to understand what you're doing. But I knew that that Jesus on the cross meant the God's, God's story of his love for human beings, that he was willing to give his son to die and to be pierced for all the bad things that we do. Mm -hmm. And that he takes us where we're, wherever we're at. And it was that love that spoke to your life. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a love that transcends language. So even at age 11, and your mom objected to what you were doing, but you still went ahead and, and I said, I want to accept Christ as my right. Savior. I, I was baptized in the, in the church that I went to. And, and uh, your mom did not interfere? She did not interfere. No, she respected the fact that we were so, I was convicted to do, the, what, you know, to do this. Hmm. And so eventually that was a testimony for her. And she, she gave her life to the Lord, and my sister gave her life to the Lord as well. So you were the first in the family to come to Christ? Yes. How yes. did you influence your mother? Um, I don't know if it was my influence. I can't, I can't take that responsibility. What I can tell you is that um, it was consistent. Hmm. It, was, um, it was conviction, not, not willing to step down, not willing to just because your, you know, your mom says, no, don't do it. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it was something was really powerful. Was it something else beside the love that made you feel like this is the right thing for me to do? This is what I want to do. You talked a lot about com conviction. So, you know, when I was a little girl I, and in Italy, we slept in these like, you know, kind of like these it was like a, like, like a, ha like, I don't know how to explain. It was these like very simple r rooms where they give to people who are homeless. Mm. And I would lay there and I would look at the, I would look it up and I would say to whoever was out there, I'd say, is this it? Like, what are we? What mm. is this flesh? Mm. What are we doing in this life? What are we meant to be doing? Are we just to be these fleshy organisms that walk around and, do the same mechanical things over and over again, day after day. What is the great purpose of our, you know, this person, this thing? That's too, uh, <laughs> too deep for a child. So you had, you had like uh, the questions of life even at, at an early age. Well, perhaps. So perhaps. I, I wanted to know what was our purpose? What, what, is, what are we doing walking around on this planet? Okay. And so when I met Jesus, when I met him, he gave me my purpose. How's that? I am to display that love that I saw on the cross to others so mm -hmm. that they can see him. Mm -hmm. To love people, no matter how, how many bad things they do, no matter how dirty they are, no matter how ugly their lives seem, mm -hmm. that we are meant to love. It seems like um, you were... You, you were so much affected by the lack of love that you 
kind of experience in, in the Muslim society and the fact that you had always to do something for God to love you and for God to spare you uh, the torture of hell. And that idea, it seems like, tormented you to the point like you embraced this love of Christ. Well, you can only feel true love and light when you've been in the dark, right? Mm. That's true. <laughs> you can't intense. really appreciate it until you've been in the dark. And um, I think that abandonment, you know, makes, makes, well, it creeps in to your soul and it makes you feel ugly or unwanted mm. or not good enough. Um, and so to feel that rush of, of love, of true love, you can't deny it. That's true. So... You talked about like your family being broken, crushed when you uh, came to the United States because of the separation that happened between your father and your uh, mother. And you talk a lot of abandonment. It seems like that feeling really um, hit you in, in your inner being. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, God gives you a mom and a dad for a reason. There's a purpose for both of those two people in, in your life as you grow up and then you develop as a human being, as a person. And I think that not having my father in my life sort of shaped me and shaped the person that I've become mm -hmm. because um, the, the things you learn from your mother are very different than the things you learn from a father. And especially right. as a woman, you gain your identity from your father. You want to feel loved and, and beautiful and wanted. Right. You know, and of course your mother teaches you other things, but my mother taught me to be a, you know, a warrior, to fight, to not give up, to, you know, to keep going um, and tough, you know, mm -hmm. she made me tough. But the, the love that you get from the opposite sex, you know, makes you feel like a woman mm -hmm. and you know, not having my father in my life really um, left empty space for God to feel, to be the father that I needed in my life mm -hmm. and to shape my, my, my identity as a woman. Sometimes I hear from people, uh, especially from women who grew up without a father or even men, when you grow up without a father or with uh, like an abusive father or a father who has abandoned the family, that it's hard for them to accept God as the God of love because they will always project the, the, the image of their uh, biological father on the heavenly father. So it, they have a hard time relating. Mm. Was that a hard thing Not for you? Not at all, actually. It was completely opposite for me. Mm. It, was, it, it, was, um, it was almost like perfect, you know? Because you finally- Because he filled that void. Mm. He filled that void of, and, and yet, you know, the concept of a father was, was kind of strange for me when I first sort of understood it, because obviously I was learning to speak English, and, but I loved it. Mm. I loved to know that there was a f heavenly father in my life. And maybe as a child, I didn't really um, understand, you know, really the depth of what that meant. Mm. But every single time in my life I've needed a father, my heavenly father has met me. Mm -hmm. So you accepted Christ at uh, age of 11. And uh, how did you grow? How did you mature spiritually? Where did you go after that? What did you do with your life? Well, um, obviously, you know, there was Sunday school classes and there was, you know, Awana. There were, you know, people in our lives that mentored me, women, really strong Christian women who um, inspired me to keep myself pure mm -hmm. and to grow and mature. Um, I think my life experiences, you know, um, watching my mother build a life, build her American dream. Um, I, I've always felt like there's this, this thirst mm -hmm. inside of me to stay close to God, to stay close to His Word. His Word is so powerful. It's sharp. It's piercing. 
um, sometimes I've learned through the mistakes that I've made when I've walked away from him mm. and how he never left me. Have you walked away from him? Yeah, I walked away from him. Why? To be selfish. Because mm, not walked away in the sense that I denounced him, but when I wanted to choose my flesh, mm. when I wanted to choose Sagar's way, mm. you know? And man, does he break you? Do you, mind, <laughs> do you mind telling me, maybe I don't, I, you don't need to go into details, but it's, it's very important, like when um, someone like yourself get to uh, experience the Lord uh, at an early age, and then you love him this much, and then you go on, you know, this uh, time of um, kind of abandoning him. Well... What happens there in the, in, the, in the mind of a, I would say you were a teen by then uh, or like oh, yes. you're young. Uh, so what would okay. happen in, in the mind? I'm going to tell you what tell happens. Me. Then because this might help, you know, other people to know what goes in a teenager mind, especially if they grow up in a knowing Christ. Well, what happens is you're a, t you're a young lady. You don't have a father, mm. a, f a earthly father. You have a heavenly father that you know in your conscious, you know, that you know, but you want to be loved and you want to, you want to see if you're noticed. Mm. And so I was seeking my father's love okay. in a man, thinking that my identity was in what someone else thought of me as a woman. Mm. So I... Um, chose my flesh. It's like in any relationship, any, uh, like a husband and wife, when you feel that your, your spouse isn't giving you what you want, you know, people cheat. Right. So I kind of cheated. On Christ. On Christ. Okay. You know, even though he's my lover, you know, he loves me and um, uh, he doesn't force me to stay, but he never leaves me. Mm. And so I became a mom at the age of 19. I had a child out of wedlock mm. because I was searching for something. And so... Be because although you have experienced God's love, but you still had to... Fleshly stuff yes. that comes out as a young woman. And, and that, like the bridge, I guess, between the unconsciousness and consciousness, you know, the, that in your unconsciousness you have not experienced the true love of a man in your life that and yeah. that's what you needed that's right and so i searched for it in the wrong place and so i became i got pregnant and i was humiliated mm. and i wanted to have an abortion mm. so that nobody would know secretly you know my mom and my family you know, I'm because Persian. You, you this, still came from a culture this that this is a big to shame. People. <laughs> right. That's right. That doesn't happen to us. You know, it doesn't happen to our culture. It's, mm. it's shameful to yes. come to our, you know, to come to your family and say, I'm pregnant. What do you do? You take care of it quietly. So I was going to take care of it quietly. And again, another woman in my life who loved me and cared for me, um, who was a mentor. Mm. I used to babysit for her. I was in college and I, and I confided in her. I said, look, this is what's happened and I'm going to have an abortion. And she said, Sarah, you can't do that. That's murder. Mm. And I was like, yeah, but you know what my mom's going to do to me? <laughs> this doesn't happen to girls like me. So um, she prayed with me and of course, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. I had an appointment and I was going to go take care of it and I chose not to. And so now I have been blessed with this amazing young man in my life who has taught me what it is to have a man mm -hmm. in your life. Mm -hmm. And you talked about, does Jesus break you? He broke you oh. when you left him. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I mean, you know, I was humiliated, you know. Mm -hmm. I was a woman who didn't have a husband, mm -hmm. who was going to be a mom. I was supposed to go to school and you know, make my mother proud. And I felt very ashamed that, because I wanted so much to be pure. Mm. I wanted so much to stay pure. But 
in that moment, you don't think about that, but my conscience, That's true. my conscience wasn't clear. And so I think being humiliated, feeling ashamed that I did, I couldn't give my purity mm-hmm. to, um, you know, to my husband or to the person that God had chosen for me was very humiliating. That's very hard for your, for your conscience and for your soul and for your... During that uh, time, that hard time, how was like your relationship with the Lord? Like, did you feel like He betrayed you somehow? Because no, no, no. I, I felt like I betrayed Him. Okay. Yeah. Coming I mean, back to Him <laughs> with uh, ha- ha- like my father. It's like you know when you have like qirat or like you know shame to go to your father and say I've done something wrong or I've. You know, I've betrayed my our family, or you know, I felt like I I I betrayed my father in heaven. Mm. You know that I didn't wait on him to send me a husband. So, but he took me back, you know, and he restored me, and he and through the different people he sent into my life, my pastor now who I love dearly, mm. um, you know, the people who came around me and and surrounded me and didn't make me feel like I should be ashamed. Because no one could be uh, spared from at any time in their life, you know, being in a shameful situation or doing something that they never wanted to do, but they, for some reason we do it. The Bible says that we're all sinners, that we all fall short, that we're mm-hmm. never going to be perfect, not mm-hmm. in this life. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, But that's, that's <laughs> the beauty of Christ, that with repentance, you can come back and you right. and you feel it that you are really forgiven. Oh yes, absolutely. I think that um, had I gone through with my, you know, a, if I had gotten an abortion, I don't know if I would have been restored the way that I am today. Mm. Someone said to me, you know, your son is going to be a blessing. The Lord will bless you for for choosing him, mm. and he has blessed me abundantly with my son. Yep. You, you <laughs> wouldn't, um, you would have had like hard time getting over the fact that you killed a life. Yes. I mean, I know how hard it was for you, as you said, to feel unholy and to, uh, and to be ashamed that you did something that you didn't want to do, but at the same time, correcting it with killing the child, that would have been also something very heavy on your spirit and on your life. That's right. My, my, you know, I come back to conviction. I physically couldn't go through with it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had an appointment. I was going to go do it, but I couldn't. I physically couldn't do it. I, I couldn't go through with it. Something in me held me back. But even if, even if a woman has had an abortion, God still forgives you if you That's truly true. repent, if you truly feel sorry for what you've done, and you know in your heart that, that you're sorry, God is going to forgive you no matter what. Because as, we, as I said, uh, no one of us is is really um, spared from being at a time of temptation, no matter yes. what temptation is is that, no matter what sin it could be. And that's the grace of the Lord that He is always able to receive us back and forgive us as soon as we repent from the heart. That's right. That's right. So you really have been through a lot, Sorer, since the age of six until, you know, um, you had that child and um, tell me a little bit you said that you um, you worked with uh, the uh, confederation of uh, Iranian students yes um, about seven eight years ago I was led to really just uh, search out my my past and my roots uh, I wanted to know what it meant to be Iranian mm-hmm. again as, a, as an adult. Uh, again, I had very few memories of Iran, but I felt very nostalgic. And so I started to research the, you know, the underground sort of movements and things that were going on, um, the political cr- climate. Uh, I, I watched a movie called Forbidden Iran. It was a documentary about the 1999 student uprising that had happened at uh, University of Tehran. And I was so fascinated by the, the bravery of these young people who chose to stand up against the Islamic Republic. Mm. And I wanted to know what happened to them. You know, why, what happened? Why didn't they sort of c- 
continue their movement. And so um, through my research and through sort of seeking out various organizations in Washington, D.C., um, I, I stumbled across the Confederation of Iranian Students, and I had the great privilege of working alongside of former political prisoners who had been imprisoned in Iran for their political activities. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I originally started volunteering with them, and then eventually I, I was asked to be there to serve as the spokesperson. And so I served there as spokesperson for the Confederation of Iranian Students for about six years. And I had the great privilege of traveling around the world and being their mouthpiece. What was the goal? In, in, well, like you, here you are, you're a Christian and uh, working for a Muslim confederation. No, the Confederation of Iranian Students' mission was to promote freedom and democracy mm. in Iran. Okay. Um, we were an organization of 10,000 plus members who believed in the separation of church and state, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of press. And so our goal was to bring the message of the Iranian people to the policymakers around the world. Um, and, and, I, and I was, you know, tapped, I had, the, I had the privilege of being tapped into the underground network in Iran and meeting young activists, and nobody mostly women. minded. I mean, still they are searching for human rights, but they're still Muslim, but they didn't mind that you are a Christian now. Well, that was actually one of the most interesting points because most of the young activists in Iran, actually I tell you, in Iran right now, we have 80 million people and 40% 40, 40 of this 80 million is under the age of 35. Right. This is a young generation. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, when I would talk to these young activists, they wanted nothing to do with Islam. Mm. They hate Islam. They've been, you know, they have been ha had Islam shoved down their throats in school, at home, in the streets. They want nothing. They're like regurgitating it now. Mm. You say Islam, they're like, stay away. No, no, don't talk to me about religion. So for them, it was like, it was always like a talking point. Why are you a Christian? What happened? And so it would always lead me to share my testimony with these young people, which became sort of a conflict. So wh but why do you think they were uh, repelled by Islam? Or as you said, they hate it. Is it because they had t too much of it? Or is it because of an awareness that it's not giving them what they need? Well, I mean, let's think about it. My generation is 31 plus years. They don't know anything else but the Islamic Republic. Mm. All they know is what to do, how to do it, when to do it what not to do mm -hmm. all the time, no matter what you're doing. I mean, especially for a woman, you know, um, I think for a woman, they got the short end of the stick. It's the worst for a woman. The woman has to deal with the worst part of the oppression. Right. And so when they see for 31 years, their government is shoving a, a religion down their throat that has brought no fruit mm -hmm. to, the, to the country. You know, Khomeini came with the Islamic you know, ideology, oh, I'm going to put roses in the hands of the people. Well, where are the roses? What happened to mm -hmm. my country? There's no economic growth. There's no jobs for young people. The country is suffering. Mm -hmm. They've been isolated from the, everyone in the, in the free world because of their viol the violations of human rights, the violations of, you know, nuclear proliferation. So, you know, pe young people now have access to the internet and okay. they can see that the lies that they were fed for 31 years are, you know, it's, it's false. Mm -hmm. Everything that they've been taught to, you know, is not what it seems. And so the, the, the Internet opened up this window to the outside world to see, wait a minute, the West isn't this great Satan, mm -hmm. you know. Israel isn't the great little Satan. People are just like you and me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what really Islam did is the opposite of what they wanted, wanted it to do. Exactly. They, you know, they wanted to separate them from the world, make them feel superior to the world and that you can live without them. But here you are like what it, it created out of you is something that I really want something different. And what's different is better. Yes. Unfortunately, it's caused a lot of problems, too, in my, you know, in my research and in my learning um, about what had happened to my generation, I saw that, you know, because women are mostly op oppressed, 
you know, the woman has uh, less opportunity, so the woman is led to prostitution. Hmm. The woman is led to drugs. Really? The woman is led to, you know, th because you can only show your face in Iran. You know, the woman doesn't look Persian anymore. She looks like an American Barbie doll. She does a nose job. Like, she does, you know, lip injections. She looks, doesn't look Persian anymore because mm -hmm. she wants, this is her only place that she can express herself. So she's changing everything to look unlike Persian. Mm. She wants to look nothing like what, you know, oh, Islam tells you don't have sex? Well, guess what? I'm gonna go and I'm gonna have sex well, with- I, I need to understand a little bit this point. Like when you live under such an oppressing regime when everybody's eyes are on a, on a woman, like the father is watching you, the brother is watching you, the government is watching you, is watching the street, watching the little young man. And you tell me about like this prostitution and, uh, and, and drug uh, trafficking or use or whatever. How does it happen? How does it happen? Well, most... It means it teach, it's, they're teaching most, you ways of being like sneaky and... Well, the internet opened again. The internet is a great tool, okay. but it can be a very dangerous tool. There's, you know, all, thing, all kinds of things going on in the internet that's teaching you about your flesh. Mm. It's connecting you to other people. It's giving you networks. You know, right now it's like a popular thing for a woman to have like 10 or 12 boyfriends in Iran, to be married and have a boyfriend on the side mm. or to have a girlfriend on the side. Um, so really, instead of taking you to an, uh, like a higher place of ethics and um, it's done the complete opposite it's, it's done the complete, complete opposite. opposite although i mean you you have you know you have a different you have different obviously um generations you have you know your artistic group you have your political groups you have your intellectuals obviously the intellectuals are all in jail because they're not allowed to think mm -hmm. but um for the most part my generation if you're not studying you're out of work or you're serving in the military um and young girls you know, are running around trying to figure out their identity and, you know. So, so I'm listening to you here and, uh, and maybe somebody else is like me thinking she is drawing a really dark picture of Iran. How factual and how realistic is the picture that you're drawing of Iran here? I wish that I could draw you a picture that shows daisies and flowers and balloons and it's you know I wish that I could do that but I can't because I'd be lying to myself and to you mm. what I know is that today for my generation there is no hope in Iran there's no and you were connected to your generation because of you know being a spokeswoman for the uh, student confederation in yes. Iran well I, I still maintain my networks but um, in May of 2013, I, I resigned and I felt like it was a God was calling me away from working in politics. I didn't want to, I, I didn't, I didn't speak their language anymore. I don't know if that makes sense. Hmm. You know, the, my, my, my heart was telling me that and it doesn't matter how much freedom and democracy that you talk about with people hmm. until your conscience is clear before God, you are never free. So all the way like you were hoping for freedom and um, for your um, the generation, your generation in Iran at the same time, like you wanted them to really know Christ as a savior. I mean, that what would happen is I would build these, I had built relationships with the, all these young people inside Iran. And, you know, eventually our relationship sort of, it stopped, we stopped talking about politics. Our conversations always shifted. Well, what's the joy? It was like, the, why are you always happy? Mm. You know, well, what, what, why are you always happy? You know, just because I live in America, that doesn't mean because I have freedom of speech or freedom of, you know, press or what have you. It doesn't, that's not why I'm happy. I'm happy because my conscience is clear, mm. you know, and I, I have a God who loves me. And so my conversations started becoming sharing my testimony. Okay. And so this... How was it received? When you share your testimony, how would it be received? Well... I had two sort of uh, reactions. One, I, I've led a couple of my friends to, to the Lord. And then you have your, your intellectuals who are like, well, you know, yes, okay, so no religion, just God. Mm. You know, they make up their own sort of, you know, 
they have this own idea. Well, yeah, but, but maybe religion is the problem. They have been oppressed to the point like, I don't want anything to do with religion. No anymore. religion. Just Islam has made religion this like horrible thing that, you know, and I, and I always say it's not a religion. It's a relationship. It's a two way relationship. Mm. It's not forced. You have a choice. God is at the door and he's knocking. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Do you want me? If you want me, I come in. So that is always my conversation piece is it's, it's not a religion. It's a relationship. Well, do you think what happened to youth in Iran um, has any reflections in the, in the Arab world? Like, what do you think the, the, uh, the young people in other Arab countries, uh, Muslim countries, um, are like um, facing or hoping or thinking or are, are they, do they feel the same thing about Islam? I think that the internet has a specifically Facebook and social media has provided a platform, a space. You know, in Iran, we joke, we call Facebook, Facebookistan, because it's this place where we all come, we don't see our religion. Facebookistan? Facebookistan. What's that? It's kind of like a country. Oh. A, a, this, this virtual country. Oh, okay. You know, <laughs> where, where you come, no one sees your religion. No one cares where you're from. Your borders mm. aren't, don't, they don't matter, but we have all connected. Thanks, Mark Zuckerberg. Um, you know, we connect, we see each other as human beings. We don't really, we don't care about the, the, the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in, in having these networks, I think that the whole region the, of the Arab world, we now see each other on a human level. In, in traveling and in meeting various, you know, people, um, you know, we, we, would always, we would always say, you know, we, we are humans first. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter, you know, what, what God you worship. Mm, it, it doesn't matter whether you're Christian, Jew, or Jew, whatever. Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, love transcends mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Love transcends. And, and love and the concept of love is totally different in the Muslim world. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that concept in the Muslim world. And, and is there really a hunger for it among uh, the, the young generation? Well, I think that because Islam is a very proper, you know, you have a very proper stoic relationship between male, female specifically. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not to look at people in their eyes, a speci specifically a woman is not to look at a man in his eyes. You're not supposed to have too much touch, mm -hmm. too much physical interaction. You know, um, I think it creates this sort of you're in, a, you're in this space, mm -hmm. especially for a woman who is under hijab, who is under, under, I call prison made of fabric. Mm. You cannot be who you are. You have this, this boundary around you. You know, love is so many things and one of them is touch, Right. you know? And so um, what I, I would always make a, make a point in hugging people in my travels to show them that I'm, it's safe. You can, you know, you can come close to me especially when I would meet women who are under, you know, hijab, they, they, they would think it's too much, mm -hmm. you know, it's, no, it's okay. No, don't worry. Well, you have to remember, they, they even can't talk about it. Right. So expressing it is, it becomes even probably harder. Yes. But um, I want to tell the women that are watching today that there's power in the name of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes when I talk to the young women in Iran and they don't understand, or even young men, you know, some of the people that I'm in touch with, you know, I, they, they want this sort of this antidote or something. Well, what do I have to do? It's not really anything you have to do. There's no particular prayer or there's no, you know, yes, there's a prayer of repentance, but if you ask God to reveal himself to you, if you ask Jesus to reveal himself to you, he will do it. Amen. He will do it. He may do it in, in a time that's not like you want it, but he will do it. Amen.
And so if you're afraid, if you're scared, if you're not sure, um, cry out to God and he will answer you. That I know with all my heart and all my soul. Amen. Tell me, Sorer, what is the hope you think for Iran, for the younger generation in Iran? The, the hope. Yes, that they are, you said they are really suffering on every level. And they, you said a high percentage, 40% 40, 40 of the younger generation. They said, we've had enough. Yeah. The hope, if I were to speak for them, they want to be free. They want to be free. They don't want to live under an Islamic regime. Young people just want to be free. Mm -hmm. And for me, my hope for them is that in my lifetime, I can see that. Mm -hmm. my, my lifetime that I can see that. But I, I've chosen to use my, my platform to, to share my testimony with the young people that I'm in touch with, to show them that tr true freedom comes through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm their faith in Jesus Christ, they're having a relationship with the living God. It's very unfortunate because on one hand, you look and you see that those young people, especially as you said with the internet, even though the, uh, you know, the, the, the authority in place think, might think that they are really uh, imprisoning them or they are oppressing them or they are taking away their freedom and they are like um, holding them in straight in the Islamic faith, but they are not. Those young people are doing obviously what they want to do. Oh yeah. But the only thing that they have managed to take these authorities from uh, the younger generation is the, is the great opportunities of when you really live free and be of a benefit for yourself and for others, instead of using freedom to destroy yourself yeah. and destroy society. So when you give that freedom, then you will see what real freedom can produce out of a person who can use the, the powers of their soul, the power of their, their mind. mind. That's right. Unfortunately, what's, what it's created is a, is a generation of people who know how to go around the government. Deceit. To deceive, to lie, to do everything under the table. You know, everybody's paranoid of everybody. Nobody trusts anyone. Mm. You know, the, that's become the culture now. You trust no one. So, yes, it's done the exact opposite. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, yes. And then my, you know, and then my parents' generation sort of accepts it because, well, that's just the way things have always been and there's no way around it. So, you have a, you have the, you know, the older generation that tells the younger generation, well, this is just the way it is. There's nothing you can do about mm. it. And then the young generation that just sort of lives like, like zombies, I say. I, mm. I feel like they're all zombies living in their little prisons just on the Internet. And trying, trying to, to have their, like, the real life in a box. Yes. Yes. Mm. <laughs> Unfortunate. Unfortunately. Or in a cyber world that yes. is not realistic so but when you come to the reality life is broken life is nothing you know there is this broken relationships there is this as you said like marriages are, are, are not great marriages there's no. betrayal everywhere there's, there's sexual hedonism there's drug abuse there's you know it's all about and then the ones with the money you know you have sort of your upper echelons and then you have you know your low middle low class you know, the ones who have the money, they just use their money to buy mm. things to make them feel good. You know, superficial free freedom, superficial fun. To fill the void. Yes. To fill the void that <laughs> nothing can fill but God. That's right. And, and the true love of God. Apart from God, there is no happiness. There's no such thing. And the reconciliation <laughs> with the, you know, the, the, the reconciliation with God and with the conscious. Yes. That comes conscious. through Christ. That makes you feel like you are a free man. That's right. Or a woman. Yes. Um, so you, uh, you're not anymore um, wor like in, in the political arena or working with uh, the student uh, confederation in Iran. You're, you're on a totally different project now. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that project. Um, well, I joined an organization called the Jude Project. And the Jude Project seeks to um, translate uh, seminary level books and other um, Christian 
books um, into Farsi, into the five target languages of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, we're working on Farsi, um, it, you know, seminary level books, um, you know, daily devotionals. Right now, we're printing our daily bread in Farsi um, for Afghans and Iranians. Mm -hmm. And um, I serve as the outreach director, so, so we, we're seeking to um, raise awareness about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm also, I still also have a heart for, you know, the, the persecuted Christians right now in the Arab world and in the Middle East. Right. You know, I, I feel like, um, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ must rise up to the occasion. Um, so I'm working with various groups and, you know, organizations that are seeking to bring awareness to the cause of the persecuted. And... Um, most of my network in Iran right now are artists. Um, I, I feel that the artists always have a better story to tell than the politicians. <laughs> and I think because of, of the freedom that they feel in, feel in their souls, they cannot be chained. It's easier for them or for you to reach to them with, you know, the message of freedom that Christ can bring. Yes. Absolutely. Because these people, they cannot be imprisoned. They cannot be chained. Their spirit cannot be contained. They need to be creative. And being creative is part of being like God's image. That's right. Because he's the creator. Well, and I'd remind them that they have a gift. Mm. Artists, you know, God gives every single person a gift. And they're using their gift to tell a story. And, um, you know, building relationships with people. It takes time. You know, they have to trust you. They have to know that you're not just there to take from them. Mm. And so what I hope to do is to is to give them a platform to to be able for them to be able to display their their message mm. to the world. So you have been through a lot and ups and downs in your life. And I want to tell you something. It's not easy for a young woman to come on TV and say that I had a child out of wedlock. So Tell me throughout all of that, you, you look now that you are a woman that knows what she is doing. You are accomplished and uh, you are sure of who you are in Christ. No more shame. So tell me a little bit about the restoration that God does. So many people are watching out there. So many souls need to be restored for some reason or another. Marriage broken, uh, people who've done things that uh, made them feel ashamed um, and they cannot either accept themselves anymore or think that if I, can, if I pray, God will forgive me. Some people even have abandoned prayers because they think, what's the point? I am a horrible person. God is not going to hear me. And so tell me about that restoration. God loves you no matter how many bad things you do. If you, if you go before him and you prostrate to God and you surrender your soul and your spirit to him and ask for forgiveness, there is power in his name. Mm -hmm. There is power in the name of Jesus. I found my identity. I found my self-worth and who I am as a woman and as a human being in Jesus Christ. And um, I answer to no one but him. Mm -hmm. And um, he has picked me up. Every time I've fallen, every time I've broken, he's picked me up. And it's, it's, like, a, it's like an anchor, you know. He, he just holds you really tight and he never lets you go. You may, you may distance yourself from him, but once you call out to him, um, that's it. You're his forever. He's never letting you go. The power of shame is so strong and Satan knows how to use the power of shame over someone's life. But Jesus' ability to break that shame is amazing. Well, he nailed, he, his, his nails hold those, the, that shame. The nails on his, you know, it was, everything was nailed to the cross. It, it was finished at the cross. Tell me a little <laughs> bit, approaching Jesus with that feeling of shame in you, how, tell me exactly about like, how did it go for you from feeling ashamed to feeling forgiven and cleansed again? 
That's a really good question. Um, I, I don't think it happens overnight. It's a mm. process. You know, it's a process of, you know, when when you're like the Bible says, you're like a you're like a like a piece of like clay in the potter's hands. You know, it doesn't happen like uh, you know. Oh, look at me! I, I'm forgiven. No, it it happens mm. because God takes you and He shapes you and He molds you and He, you know, it's. It, it, it takes time for this for this thing to take shape, and I'm not finished. Mm. You know, I may break again a thousand times before I die, but I know and I'm I have assurance that my God will never let me go, and He'll never break me to the point where I'll where I'll feel abandoned or you know uh, that I, I'm not good enough or that I you know yes I mean you're going to go through moments of your life where you're like okay God what are you doing with me what is this I don't get it but just know that God is there you know I I have I have my my Bible my Bible is my my uh, my my bread it's my mm. food it feeds my soul his word is you know <laughs> and I have the people in my life. I reach out to, you know, the m women in my life, the mentors that have come into my world who keep me focused. And obviously that relationship with the lover of my soul, who I, he is the person that never goes away. <laughs> so uh, it was a pleasure talking to you and uh, knowing of your amazing story. Thank you. Story of pain, brokenness, forgiveness and rising from the ashes. Thank you for sharing. Is there a, just one final word to say before we finish? Um, I would say that there's always, there's always light and that if you look for the light, if you seek the light, if you seek God, He will answer you. Amen. Amen. أحبائي مشاهدي برنامج بلا قيود حلقتنا لليل انتهت وعلى أمل لقاء جديد بترككم مع نور الرب يسوع اللي قادر يوصل لكم مهما كانت الظلمة اللي أنتم عايشين فيها اليوم مهما كان شعوركم أنه نحن بنفق مظلم لا يمكن أنه يكون في خلاص ولكن الرب يسوع قادر يوصل إلى أعمق الظلمات ويستعيد حياتكم ويرجع يبنيكم من أول وجديد صغير Thank you so much for being with me Thank today. You. It was nice Thank to you. meet you. And uh, God bless you. Halitna Tahit, Ila Liqa.